again. As always, we are so glad to worship together and we continue to pray for each one of you. We pray for our churches, our congregations, and we pray especially that the gospel message may be heard in our communities and beyond. We begin our time of praise and worship with these words. Praise the name of the Lord. Ascribe greatness to our God. Lord, open our lips and we shall praise your name. Let us pray. O oh God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace, that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Reading from the third chapter of Ecclesiastes, verses 16 through 22. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, wickedness was there. And in the place of righteousness, wickedness was there as well. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for he has appointed a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart with regard to human beings that God is testing them to show that they are but animals. For the fate of humans and the fate of animals is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and humans have no advantage over the animals, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and all turn to dust again. Who knows whether the human spirit goes upward and the spirit of animals goes downward to the earth? So I saw that there is nothing better than that all should enjoy their work, for that is their lot. Who can bring them to see what will be after them? My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, Have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, Stand there, or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, You shall not commit adultery, also said, You shall not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A seminal figure of the 20th century, Mahatma Gandhi was a practicing Hindu. Growing up during the British Raj, that is the period of British rule over the Indian subcontinent, he was exposed to and was intrigued by Christianity. In his reading of the Gospels, Gandhi was impressed by this Jesus whom Christians worshipped. He later confessed that Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, became an important source in developing his philosophies of nonviolence and non-resistance. A clergyman called the Reverend Pattison tells the following story. One Sunday morning, Gandhi decided that he would visit one of the Christian churches in Calcutta. Upon seeking entrance to the church sanctuary, he was stopped at the door by the ushers. He was told he was not welcome, nor would he be permitted to attend this particular church, as it was for high caste Indians and whites only. He was neither high caste, nor was he white. And because of this rejection, the Mahatma turned his back on Christianity. Later on, the Methodist missionary E. Stanley Jones, one of, one of Gandhi's closest friends, asked him, Mr. Gandhi, though you quote the words of Christ often, why is it that you appear to so adamantly reject becoming a Christian? The latter's reply was clear. Oh, I, I don't reject your Christ. I love your Christ. It's just that so many of you Christians are so unlike your Christ. Let us turn to our epistle lesson, James chapter 2, verse 1. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? James is asking us a difficult question by this. He's asking us, are you denying the Christian faith with acts of favoritism, with acts of partiality? Well, if you wanted to deny the faith, what would you do? Would you just wake up one morning and, and decide that you want to deny the faith? How do we go about doing that? Do you renounce your church membership? Do you write a book or a pamphlet criticizing the central tenets of Christianity? Do you join the local atheist club? In this passage, James tells us that one of the ways we can deny the faith is this. Try showing favoritism towards some and bias towards others. James counts that as a fundamental denial of the gospel. To show favoritism is a denial of the faith and a denial of the gospel. Well, if this is true, we better find out what he means by favoritism. What does James mean by personal favoritism? Well, let's start off with what he doesn't mean, what James does not mean by personal favoritism. Well, among other things, he doesn't mean that it's wrong to make appropriate distinctions. It would be totally wrong to condemn, let's say, if one of us met an elderly person at the door, a person maybe on crutches or in a wheelchair, and at the same time, a, a healthy young man was coming in. There would be nothing wrong with us bringing that person who was older or infirm into uh, a convenient place to sit uh, during the service. That would be a manifestation of love, even though we are making distinctions. This distinction does not come from bias or, or shallow prejudice. It comes from a manifestation of love. There's a need that the elderly person may have that the young person doesn't have. And the response of love is to make a distinction in that circumstance. Also, James doesn't mean that we ought not show due deference to some people. If, say, our bishop announces that he will, will worship with us next Sunday, then there would be nothing wrong with us showing a bit of thoughtful respect to him, should he intend on visiting. I'm quite sure that we would plan where the bishop would sit, and that would be followed by a robust debate on the merits of iced tea versus punch and on which sort of cake we should, we should serve as we invite said bishop to the fellowship hall. James is not arguing about some sort of, of radical egalitarianism that wipes out all social distinctions. 
he does not say that you, we, we can't show due respect to people in authority. That's not James' point. For us in Christ's holy church, favoritism means bias. It means partiality. It means prejudice. And I believe for most, most of us, uh, our innate sense of justice rises up in protest against favoritism. Indeed, our, our many experiences in this world confirm the foolishness of favoritism. Favoritism is the breakdown of, of many human relationships. In the family, for example, uh, parents create havoc when not treating their children fairly. Uh, a mom or a dad who shows partiality to one child over another can do serious damage to both by either deflating one's ego so they feel inadequate or over inflating another's ego so that child feels superior not only to his or her brother and sister, but to the peoples of the world in general. Some may recall during our school days that there is something called the teacher's pet, favoritism and impartiality. Now, I'm not sure how something like that affects our learning, uh, but it's certainly annoying to the rest of the class, as you may uh, indeed sense by the mild disdain in my voice that I, I was never a teacher's pet. Um, Unless, of course, that was a pet snake or a pet tarantula or something like that. In the Old Testament, partiality in a court of law was particularly condemned. It's recorded in Second Chronicles 19. Consider what you are doing, for you judge not on behalf of human beings, but on the Lord's behalf. He is with you in giving judgment. Now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take care of what you do, for there is no perversion of justice with the Lord our God or partiality or taking of bribes. So if this is true in the family, in the schools, in the courts of law, then it is equally true in the church. The church is the one institution in which favoritism is not only regrettable, but it's actually self-contradictory. A church characterized by partiality is no longer a church because it denies an essential element of its identity. James' main theme in today's text is the radical incompatibility of Christianity and favoritism. They don't mix. Either the church destroys favoritism or favoritism destroys the church. You can't have both. So the first thing James tells us is that partiality is incompatible with the church of Jesus Christ. Verses 1 through 4. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? Here the, the, the logic is plain. James is telling us that as Christians we have a common faith in Jesus Christ, and this levels us. If he is your Lord and he is my Lord, then we are both servants of the Lord. We are equally his servants. We are brothers and sisters in the Lord. There's something, something fundamentally leveling in our faith. If God is our Father and Jesus is our Lord, then we are brothers and sisters. We, we are equal in Christ. Now, James gives us this test. He, he uses this example that two strangers, uh, two newcomers, they don't know anybody in our church. The first man is wearing an expensive watch. He has good teeth. He's, he's slim. Apparently, he's affluent. He has all of his suits made on Savile Row. Uh, this man seems accustomed to being taken seriously. He seems influential. Oh, how good of him to come, we think. Well, the service has started, and you need to seat him not in the front where he might be embarrassed, but a place with a good view nonetheless. And you show him where in the service you are, and then you walk back and you see a poor person in dirty clothes. In the 1611 King James Version, it reads, For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. Vile raiment literally means revolting clothing. So this man stinks of, of urine and booze. He hasn't showered in days. He hasn't washed. And what do we say? We say, look, stand over there. Stand in the corner. If so, verse 4, have you not made distinctions amongst yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? 
have we not wavered? On one hand, we say that we believe in Jesus Christ, but on the other hand, we're, we're total snobs. Or, after the service has ended, some people want to talk to us. They may even have something serious to discuss. But, but over there are, are the rich, the attractive, the witty, the ones that you want to talk to. And so what do we do? We immediately start scheming to, to get away from those who we don't want to talk to so we could talk to the other person. What's the quickest way I could wrap up this conversation? If, if so, then again, verse 4, have you not made distinctions among yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? How can our attitude towards our brothers and sisters be determined by externals? If we are externized to the attractive, well-dressed person and rather rude to those who, who are not, then we are no longer treating them as brother and sister, but we are treating them as their judge. And God does not assess people by their external looks. For Samuel 16.7, the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. But we do, we judge and we evaluate people by what they look like and what they're wearing. Therefore, if we do this, we become their judges and not their brothers and sisters. It was noted by a contemporary of John and Charles Wesley that the Methodist movement was not a religion for the poor, but a religion of the poor. It was a movement where those who were not highly placed in society could readily identify with this wonderful phenomenon that was taking place amongst them of their own people that fit with their own lifestyle. It was for them. The music was popular and identifiable. The social, social concerns were concerns that many Methodists held, and, and there was no patronage by any wealthy benefactor. That's the way it should be within the church. So favoritism is not only incompatible with Christ's holy church, but it's also incompatible with the election of God's people. Verses 5 through 7, Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? This uh, election of God's people. We, we read in the Old Testament that God chose Israel over all nations to be his people. St. John records our Lord saying that you didn't choose me, I chose you. Uh, the, the great Apostle Paul goes even further in the first chapter of Ephesians. He says, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless, blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now James complicates things a bit by saying that the people God chooses are the poor, but this is not because God favors the poor. If this was so, then God would be, he would be guilty of the same partiality that he so abhors. But rather that the election of God reverses the values of this world. You and I may prefer the company of the rich, the glamorous, and the powerful, but God chooses the poor, often the material poor, but always the spiritually poor. God chooses those humble enough to acknowledge their bankruptcy before him so that they may become rich in faith. They may become heirs to the kingdom of God. Remember what Jesus teaches in Matthew 5. He, he doesn't say, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. No, our Lord says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, wealth, fame, and power, which are assets in this world, give people no advantage whatsoever in the kingdom of God. In fact, it may be the reverse. Wealth, fame, and power are disadvantages in the kingdom of God unless people are willing to humble themselves in order to enter the kingdom. God humbles the proud and exalts the humble. This is the very essence of the Christian message. He impoverishes the rich and enriches the poor. So, James concludes, how can we dishonor those who God has honored or how could we insult those whom God has chosen? Partiality and favoritism are incompatible with Christ's church, with God's election, and thirdly, they are incompatible with the law of God. Verses 8 through 11, you do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Favoritism 
is incompatible with God's law of love. James is quoting Le- Leviticus 19.18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The, the royal law, he calls it. This is the law of, of God's own kingdom. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus quotes this as the second greatest law. Uh, James says that we don't have to be murderers or, or adulterers to be lawbreakers. It, it isn't only sins of commission, but sins of omissions that are sins. If we fail to love our neighbors as ourselves, then we fail in keeping the law of love. Favoritism is failure in love. We, we cannot be guilty of partiality if we really love our neighbor. But he continues, verses 10 and 11, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, You shall not commit adultery, also said, You shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, then you have become a transgressor of the law. James says that although you may have been holy in one area of the law, you may be less than holy in another area. You could be pursuing godliness, as you think, in some areas of life, and yet ignoring God's word in other areas. And so what does that make us? It makes us lawbreakers. And if we realize the demands of keeping the whole law, what do you think it's going to do to us besides drive us crazy? It's going to drive us back to God for his mercy. Because we know that if we stand before God and we're judged by our keeping of the law, our performance, then we fail miserably. What's going to happen? We're going to be condemned. And and this leads us to our final statement. Thus far, we have noted that favoritism and partiality are incompatible with the church of God, with the election of God, and with the, the law of God. And now we conclude by asserting that favoritism is incompatible with the judgment of God. Or if you like, favoritism is incompatible with the mercy of God, as God's judgment is both merciful and has the pronounced element of judging. Thus, verse 12, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. This is a real encouragement. Let's look back to verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point has become accountable for all of it. If you are trusting in your own performance, if you say that I'll do everything perfect, then be forewarned. If you fail even in one area, then you fail in every area. But God is merciful. He gives us the law of liberty. This is to say that when you stand before the throne of Christ, you won't be judged according to your works. Because if you're judged according to your works, you'll be condemned. You'll be found guilty. But we are, we are judged according to Christ's works. We are accepted according to Christ's works. We've been declared righteous according to Christ's works. We have been invited into the kingdom of God because of Christ's works. That's the law of liberty. And he says now that if you receive that mercy from God, if you receive that liberty, that freedom from the bondage of sin and condemnation through the mercy and grace of God, then how are you going to treat other people? Isn't your heart going to overflow with mercy? James argues that if God is merciful in his judgment with us, then we must be merciful in our judgment of others. Judgment without mercy will be meted out to those who show no mercy. In other words, if you hope to receive God's mercy, then you must show mercy yourself. Again, Matthew 5, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Our final verse is 12 and 13. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Have we ever seen that in relation to the cross? The cross is the supreme expression of both the the mercy and the judgment of God. For in the cross, justice is satisfied. But in the cross, mercy is triumphant towards sinners who repent and believe. There are two lessons that we could take away from today's text. First, that this is a case study in Christian behavior. James was faced with an elementary problem within the early church, an elementary problem that still exists today, and that is class distinctions. Now, you might think that James would simply forbid the whole notion of partiality and favoritism and then go on to the next 
subject, or maybe you'd just give a certain example or principle in order to eliminate class distinction. No, James explores this subject not only by example, but in theology. James knows that doctrine and ethics go hand in hand. You see, we will never act in the way God wants us to act if we don't think in the way God needs us to think. That's why it's so important for us to, to develop a Christian mind, to learn to think Christianly, persevere in the study of Scripture so that we have a perspective in Scripture. And secondly, this is a case study in Christian relationships. I hope we all know that what the gospel doesn't do is save isolated individuals and perpetuate loneliness. What the gospel does do is unite us in the new community of Jesus Christ in which there are new principles in operation, which are vastly different from the principles that operate in our secular culture. In the new community of Jesus Christ, all of our relationships are transformed. And because, as we have seen, the gospel levels us. It makes us brothers and sisters. We are one, equal in dignity and value in the sight of God by our being related to Jesus Christ. Now, if the church had been the church throughout the ages, the, the new community of Jesus, and had manifest these new and radical relationships, I tell you, the church would have had a greater impact uh, on the world outside, because the, the church would not only have preached the gospel, but would have embodied the gospel. And people would not only have heard the gospel, but they would have seen it in our daily lives. And so we need to listen to the summons of James. He says to us today, just as he did two millennia ago, he says, brothers and sisters, do not hold the glorious faith in Jesus Christ with favoritism because faith and favoritism don't mix. They, they are incompatible with each other. To show favoritism is to deny the faith while repudiating favoritism is to confess the faith of the new community of Jesus. A, a vital faith will lead us in demonstrating mercy by accepting others, especially those who are different from us, those who make us feel uncomfortable, those who are less fortunate than we are. And, and it will transform our Christianity. It will transform our Christian witness if we really begin to live this out. But I, I, I do want to say, dear friends, it's painful to live this out. It's difficult. It's, it's not easy and it costs us, but that's the cost that Jesus calls us to. And so we ask that God to begin to start changing our hearts here and now, and may he be pleased to use it for his church's revival. It is my prayer that God give us grace not only to be faithful hearer of these words, but obedient doers of these words. Amen. Abide with me, fast for the even time. The darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide.
as we bring our service to a close, I again remind everyone that we are worshiping in person. Every Sunday, our first service is at 8.30 in our Shohawken Church, 9.45 at the Emory Methodist Church in Hancock, New York, and the Lake Como Church is at 11 o'clock. And now for a word of blessing. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and us, now and at the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, rest to the faithful departed, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, eternal life and glory. For you are alive and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.